So why were the Greeks so influential, even though they were sacked by Rome nearly 200 years before Jesus? That's what we'll talk about today. Fair Greece, sad relic of the departed worth. Immortal, though no more. Though fallen, great. Lord Byron, I'm probably terrible at reading poetry. But you get the idea. Greece was great, even though they were sacked by Rome. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about people who existed inside of Israel at the time. And so the first groups we're going to talk about are the Greeks. And you might be saying, oh, no, not more history, Joe. Why more history? And I do like history a lot, but I want to set the stage for the death of Jesus. We have all these people group that Jesus talks to, that Jesus includes or scorns in his parables and stories. And we understand who they are. We can understand why Jesus had a bone to pick with them or why Jesus was sending people to preach with them. Most of the apostles spoke Greek. Jesus knew Greek and the Greek influence was still huge inside of Israel at that time. We will see Hellenized Jews and talk about Paul, who was considered to be a Hellenized Jew. He knew a lot about Greek philosophy and the Greek culture and addressed them specifically because he understood them so well. He probably, before becoming a follower of Jesus, was one of those Jews who followed a more Greek lifestyle. And it wasn't really at the time of Israel in the same way. They sacked the entire Israel area in 330 BC. The last book of the Old Testament was somewhere around 440 BC. And then 70 years later, Alexander the Great comes in there and smashes the whole area. And Alexander is kind of an interesting guy. He did sack these areas, but usually what he did is he put in a local leader He asked for a lot of literature and materials about the culture. He was interested in everybody, but he kept pushing farther west. You know, he was looking for Troy. He was looking for Babylon. He was trying to press also all the way through to India, where eventually he died. Alexander the Great then, like I said, pushed all the way through. There were Hellenized areas, Ashkelon, Jaffa, Jerusalem, Gaza, and Nablus. Ashkelon was where I was on an archaeological dig and I found a pet cemetery. You can read all about it. When I was there, I found the first 19 dog burials and eventually there was like 1,200 more. The Philistine people hated dogs, but these were nicely buried dogs. And so they felt this find indicated a large Greek presence in the city. We found a lot of Greek statues and pottery there too. So even the dog cemetery says Greek. Ashkelon became a Greek trading hub as was Jaffa, which is also along the coast as well. Eventually, the Greeks themselves became more dispersed after Alexander died. His kingdom kind of got split up between local leaders and the Seleucian leaders, ended up taking over the area that is the land of Israel. But the Greek-speaking area became very popular. Like I said, a lot of people fell in love with the Greeks, including the Romans, but they liked how sophisticated the philosophy was. They liked how deep they had thought about certain things. The language was much more expressive. So Jewish people who were speaking Aramaic, which they learned when they were sacked by Assyria, Aramaic, which was also a Semitic language, which means it's related to Hebrew, started speaking Greek. And so then the Old Testament gets translated into Greek by Jews living in the the kingdom of Ptolemy. And that was probably somewhere around the second century BC. There were also some paraphrasings as well. And if you ever heard of the dynasty of the Ptolemies, Cleopatra was part of them. So it gets wrapped up into that Greek history, but part of their kingdom was the land of Israel and the northern parts of Africa too. And even think about the Phoenicians. These were Canaanites. They used to be called Canaanites. They still continue to call themselves Canaanites, even after they were sacked by the Greeks. But if you look at their art, if you look at all the trading items that they had, they looked like Greek-styled art. But what we know of Phoenicia started somewhere around 1200 BC. And by the 9th century BC, they were a dominant culture in trade in the entire Mediterranean Sea. This land was part of the 12 tribes of Israel, but then north of that would have been Lebanon, and then it went all the way up to then what would be considered the Hittite kingdom, that now is probably part of Turkey. 
Their trade was throughout the Mediterranean, went as far as Britain and West Africa. They too became Hellenized. Phoenician alphabet, which came from the Hebrew language or what they called a proto-Hebrew language, became Phoenician language and then spread throughout everywhere because the Phoenicians were fantastic traders. So they brought the written language to all sorts of corners of the earth a long time ago. Back to the land of Israel, their writings got included in the library of Alexandria. The 72 elders who gathered this information and gave them this Septuagint, gave it to King Ptolemy. So many Jewish people in Israel became what was called Hellenized, meaning they took on the Greek culture. So again, the Greeks take over in 330 BC, then the Hellenistic time, the period of the Second Temple. Greeks were kind of interested in the Jewish people, thought they were a little barbaric, particularly when it came to the circumcision. Understand that. But overall, they liked the idea of this very philosophical, rules-based people. Then this dynasty that came after after the Ptolemies ruled the areas of Samaria, Galilee, the whole area of Israel, and it became sort of their regional power. But what started with Alexander being open to just people being themselves, following the gods they wanted to follow and leaving people alone as long as they paid tax and didn't rebel, suddenly... After Alexander's death, everyone became more and more clamping down on their local cultures. They were building a statue to Zeus right next to the Temple Mount. Even though they said that they would help rebuild the Temple Mount, they were also tarnishing it at the same time. But that was the last straw for people. You can impose taxes. You can impose military rule. You put that Greek statue right next to our temple, and now we're talking war. That was the end of any leniency the people had towards the Greek government. So the Hasmoneans sack the Greeks, kick them out. This was the Maccabees, Judas Maccabee, among others, who fought and removed them. And they eventually, when the Romans sacked the Greeks, became very Greek-like. They took on a lot of Greek philosophies. You'll notice many of the Roman gods are very similar to the Greek gods. They just had different names. They also had different language. They spoke Latin versus Greek. But everyone then eventually spoke Greek. But there were always this sort of Hasmonean civil war. And in 63 BC, the Romans made the Hasmonean dynasty a client state. Herod the Great comes in, defeats the last reigning Hasmonean ruler because they weren't keeping the peace or they weren't running things the way the Romans wanted to, made a deal with the Romans, sacked them in 37 BC. And so then Herod takes over in 37 BC ending this Hasmonean or the Maccabees dynasty, and then building that strong relationship with Rome. Again, this is a huge overview of the entire area. There are books and books and books about this particular period of time in history. So this is a very brief discussion of it because we're trying to get to the point of Jesus. But the Greeks had a big influence on the land of Israel at this time. The Jews appreciated the Greek sophistication, their philosophies, the Stoicism. That was a big part of it. We even hear parts of Paul talking about this. Many people believe that Paul not only was a Pharisee, which he was, but he was also a Hellenized Jew, which means that he understood a great deal about the Greek culture. We even see in Acts 16 talking about how Paul went to Lystra and found the disciple Timothy, who was son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was Greek. And they ended up going to previously Greek areas and preached the gospel. And when Paul is in Athens, he gets into conversations with philosophers. And of course, the Greeks love to be philosophers, but he talked about Stoicism, Epicureanism, that is enjoying the best in life. And they listened to Paul They wondered what in the world he was talking about. They called him a babbler. And he is talking about some foreign gods we've never even heard of. But they enjoyed what he was saying enough, or it was intrigued enough, to invite him to what was called Mars Hill, which would have put him in front of intellectuals, philosophers, different kinds of people to hear the message of Paul. And Paul talked about, I was walking through your town. I see all your objects of worship. I see these items, these idols made with human hands. 
and I found an inscription to an unknown God. And I'm going to tell you who he is. He is the God who made everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth. And he goes on and speaks to the Greeks about God. So this ability for Paul to talk in Athens, stand up there toe to toe with the judges, the intellectuals, the philosophers, was because he understood it. He knew it. He was a Hellenized Jew. We'll see that many of the Jews at that time spoke Hebrew when they're talking about religious things, spoke Aramaic, but many of them spoke Greek because the Romans spoke Greek. They could speak Greek because of the years that the Greeks spent there. And so they were able to communicate. Matthew was written in Greek, although there was some thought that maybe it was originally written in Hebrew and then translated to Greek. Someone brought up this interesting point about how Hebrew is a very simple language. I learned the secret of learning Hebrew through a book I bought in Jerusalem, but essentially all words in Hebrew starts from a three-letter root and then you add on to the root. So like nor is light, menorah is lamp, tenor is oven, and you can see. But it was a somewhat limited language because of its structure. It was very good for ancient times when you're talking about trading bulls and growing crops. But then Aramaic comes along and they say, just at the point when philosophy got sophisticated, Aramaic comes along and it's a much more expressive language. And then it goes to Greek, which is very detailed, very philosophical. Suddenly, the Greek language becomes the language that we write the New Testament in. So almost like the languages got sophisticated in order to represent the sophistication of the Jewish and then Christian faith. Because the Romans took over this Greek area, they kept the Greek culture going on. And some people, like I said, appreciated the Greeks. So when Jesus talks about Gentiles, some people were saying that these were people that were Jewish who lived in very Greek ways or entirely accepted the Greek culture, the Greek religion, the Greek language. They weren't even Jewish anymore because so many of the people in that area spoke both Aramaic and Greek, but preferred Greek. Or were the Gentiles, the people were speaking about Greeks, actual Greeks who just stayed there after the times when the Hasmonean influence was there and they just stayed. It's, it's hard to know. I suspect that Gentiles means exactly what it sounds like. It's anyone who's not Jewish, whether they're Jews who became very Greek, whether they were Greeks who stayed there, whether they were Romans, whether they were Syrians or Phoenicians or Aramaic or Assyrian or Babylonian. It didn't matter. It didn't matter who they were. They just were not Jewish. So it didn't really matter who the Gentiles were, but you can tell that all those people get looped into that same group. The Sadducees were more Hellenized because they were aristocrats. They looked down, as Josephus said, upon common Jews that were living in the area. They also were trying to get along with the aristocrats of the Roman governments and the Roman higher ups. And so they took on more of the dress, more of the culture, and were a little bit less upset when Greek things, Greek gods, other parts of culture started coming in. Herod was a Sadducee, and he built the courtyard of the Gentiles because he wanted them to be able to come in to the city and have a place to be. The Pharisees, while they also were Hellenized, Paul, again, was a Pharisee, and he was Hellenized, tended to stick a little bit more to the Jewish traditions and faith and dress and were more strict about diet, the leaking in of the Greek gods. But they did appreciate the aspects of the Greeks in the sense that they had teachers and students and that relationship of learning and education that went on, that was something that was appealing to the Pharisees as long as you stayed away from Greek religion. And who wrote all about this? Josephus, a very Hellenized Jew from Assyria. But even he recognized the Sadducees and their influence and how they used the Greek to look down upon almost everyone else that wasn't them. It was also leading to other philosophical ideas coming into the Jewish land, which we'll hear about more in the New Testament. We'll hear about Gnosticism, which believes the physical is bad, only the spiritual is good. So they will not believe that Jesus was ever fully man because the physical man being is bad and evil. He was always spirit. 
He never resurrected in the body. And you'll see later in the New Testament, when we get to those parts in the Bible in small steps, us talking about the Gnostics. Then there's what is called Stoicism, which was a Greek philosophy of standing firm in persecution and doing the hard things and destroying personal desire because nature, material things, strength was the only thing that matters. Then there were people of Israel themselves who started rejecting the belief in one God. The Greeks believed in many gods and they took in many gods. So sometimes when they sacked the area and they found a God they particularly liked, they incorporated it in just like the Romans did. You will find barbarian tribes incorporated into the Roman gods because this allowed them to incorporate other people group without them rebelling. Okay, okay, we took your gods in like the Babylonians did, like the Persians did. And so there was a rejection of monotheism that there is only one God. And we see other influences of the Greeks. We see all sorts of words like apologetics is a Greek word. We see other words like Matthew used the word Parthenos because he wrote his scripture in Greek. So we see a lot of influence. But again, at the time of Jesus, the Greeks were sacked by Rome. They still had their philosophies. They still had their language. But now that's the story of the Roman Empire, the empire that swallowed Greece and became a more tyrannical version of Greece. We'll talk about that next time. My challenge to you is think about how language plays a part in how descriptive your day-to-day part is. There is groups of people who have over 300 descriptions of snow. Wow, we don't tend to have that many descriptions of snow. But when you have a different language, it allows you to be more colorful, more in-depth about certain topics. Think about language and how it plays a part in how we understand the world because of the nature of how our language is structured too. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. I hope you are okay with all this history. I'm trying to set the stage for Jesus entering Jerusalem. All the people that he has been encountering in his ministry, we've been talking about Matthew in the Bible in small steps. We need to know why he has different views of different groups of people. And we're going to hear more about it now that we're going to start getting into his time in Jerusalem. When he curses the fig, what's he talking about? Why does he curse a fig? And we're going to see that play out inside the city of Jerusalem. And remember, our walk from Greece to Rome starts with long, small, historical steps.